شكراً يا ربي شكراً هديت قلبي شكراً بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الله أكبر كبير والحمد لله كثيرا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العزيز الحكيم Esteemed hosts and dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is truly an honor to be here with you today at such a conference to host the likes of the sheikhs and imams we saw earlier discussing the future of our ummah and in relation to the life here in Canada. Mashallah, I took some great thoughts away from that about how we as Muslims must be more openly honest with our leaders whilst not tearing each other apart behind each other's backs. How we must seek unity but not thoughtlessness. We must have a point to joining together. And I thank uh, the Imams ya and Sheikh Yasser for this and all the other speakers for the knowledge that they have given. Before I begin, I should say that I am not, certainly not, a person of any great knowledge. I am a mother. I am a writer. Oh, my husband would say, hang on a minute, Islamically, I'm a wife and a mother. <laughs> I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a writer. And over all of these, alhamdulillah, I am one who submits to the will of Allah. And I cannot begin to express my gratitude that I know how to live in this dunya. So I've been Muslim now, alhamdulillah, for four years. And that's long enough to know how enjoyable it is hearing revert stories. And I hope, inshallah, today that with sharing my own small story, that we will take away from it some points about dawah, how the actions of others impacted on me when I was in a very uh, different frame of mind and wasn't looking for religion or faith. How did those people, with Allah's will, touch my heart? And how can we then act on those skills as well with those around us, inshallah. So I want to go back to the beginning. My parents in the 1960s were both in the entertainment industry. My mother was a model and my father was a well-known actor. They were two of what you could call the beautiful people. But behind that beautiful exterior was a rather shoddy backstory that involved a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs. Now, as a little girl of five, I remember praying every night. In fact, my mum said to me just a few days ago, I was speaking with the family and we were wondering why you're such an extremist now. I said, oh, that's nice. What was the conclusion? Well, I brought it back to you always being a strange little girl who used to pray. She's partly right. I'm not an extremist, inshallah. But I did used to pray. And I remember being five years old and my grandmother taught me the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer is a Christian prayer. It's actually made by Isa, alayhi salam, as he submitted to the will of Allah before his disciples. And the way that Isa alayhi salam prayed is a way that Muslims can actually still pray. Did you know that? I'm sure you know that because in Egypt just two years ago, when the Christians made that dua, so did the Muslims. They joined them as they tried to overthrow a dictator. So I used to make that prayer and then follow it with an appeal to the one God who ruled over everything. Because in a child's mind, faith is very simple. 
There's no buy one, get one free God. There's no buy one, get three free God. There's just a had, just one. So I knew that in my life, my mother made a lot of decisions. My dad made a few. My grandfather made a few decisions. My grandmother made the most decisions. We were a matriarchal family. But above them all, who was running the outside world? Who was making the leaves grow on the trees? That wasn't my grandmother. Who was making the stars shine at night? Who was making the sun rise in the morning? That was the one God. And I used to pray so hard that I even remember one of my prayers. And it was this. Dear God, please take my younger sister away. She's really horrible. But Allah is merciful. And she's with us today. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. But I knew who to appeal to, and that carried me through my whole childhood. That absolute knowledge, that certainty that God was out there. And then come the teenage years. And they are a danger zone in every community, in every time. In fact, one of the great Greek philosophers once wrote a letter describing the state of teenagers in his time, and he described it something like this. The children don't listen to their parents. They're rude to their teachers. They have no respect for society. Truly, we are a nation in trouble. This was thousands of years ago. So my teenage years came, and with it, two things happened. First, the ego comes in. You become one of those youngsters, we all go through this, by the way, who knows everything about everything. Who's got teenage children here? Right. Have you ever heard this phrase, what do you know about anything? My grandfather fought in the Second World War five, in five of the invasions of the Second World War. And I used to stand toe to toe to him when I was 15 going, what do you know about life? <laughs> I think he knew quite a bit in hindsight. So the nafs come in, the ego comes in, and with that comes another catastrophe. Potentially the hormones come in. What a mess we get ourselves into. But if you add into my teenage years the fact that my friend's mum was giving us drugs, got kind of a toxic mix. I tried, I tried to hold on to my prayer, I did. But one night a friend from school, she came over to stay at my house and as we were going to sleep I put my hands together and started to pray. Dear God, please bless mummy and daddy, dear God. My friend started to snigger. <laughs> that sound that only teenage girls make. What are you doing? She said. I said, I'm praying. She said, who are you praying to? The big man on the cloud with a beard, Santa Claus. Children are very practical. I tried to have an image of my head of what God looked like. If he was a man like my dad, my dad made mistakes. Did that mean God, the father, could make mistakes? And actually, if God was on a cloud, why couldn't I see him on a rainy day? My faith began to melt away. How hard it is to hold on to that rope of Iman, the rope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, ties us, that belief ties us to him and to safety. My hands started to slide off. And I was smoking drugs on the way to school proudly at 14. And then with my ego, I decided that I was clever enough to pass exams. And wasn't I brilliant because I was just about pretty enough to turn a few heads. And how arrogant I became. May Allah forgive me. So, after that, I became a journalist. And I started to write. And I became what we might call a minor celebrity. And I want us all to, to think about this world of celebrity that we now live in. 
And even as Muslims, our tendency to clap which I know helps the speaker because sometimes coming to a hall where everybody sits there silent, I know when I wasn't a Muslim, I was thinking, wow, this is a tough crowd. Nobody's clapping anything. But actually, you know what? When you clap, it damages us. It makes us think we're different from you. The correct way we know is to make takbir and to praise Allah. So please help all of us speakers here not to go back to ways that damage our own track with Allah, inshallah. But I used to love the applause. That's why I can talk about it. I trained as an actress, and I was an actress for seven years. And if you speak to any actor and say, why do you do a job that makes you mostly poor, you know, uh, into all kinds of situations, why do you put up with it? They will say, the applause. It's addictive, it's like a drug. When you're in that state, you want it. You want the fame, and people will give it to you. And I had a little bit of it, and it became quite toxic. I was a minor celebrity who, in my world, thought I was the major celebrity in the universe because everybody became a little star in my orbit of ego. My husband at the time, my kids, my parents, everything revolved around my nafs. So as a, as a Muslim, I know the moments that I want to ask other people about. And one of them is, okay, what's the moment when the light got in? When did you first feel that the universe was about something different? When did that happen? And I've thought about this long and hard. And it comes down to this moment for me. In 2000, I had my first daughter. Her name is Alexandra. And you know the birth of a first child for both parents, but I promise you, especially for the mother, is a moment of transcendence. You, all, you leave your body, you, you, your heart bursts with a love you didn't even know was there when you first look into those eyes. And more than that, you want the world to be a better place. I went instantly overnight from someone who used to listen to Eminem and rap stars to someone who didn't like loud music too much. Well, not that kind of music because I didn't want women to be abused. I didn't want that kind of language around my daughter. In the year 2000, in December, my daughter was a month old and I was holding her to me and I was watching the evening news and a photograph came on that would change my life. And it was this photograph. There is a young boy, he looks 10 years old, but actually he's 14, he's small for his age. And all you can see is the back of him because the cameraman is behind him. And the little boy is standing like this. And what is amazing is that he's about to throw something. It's a dynamic photograph. But what is more amazing, brother and sisters, brothers and sisters, is that just a few meters away, gigantic, bearing down on him is a tank. Now, if you and I were here, I didn't tell you he had a stone in his right hand, did I? If you and I, may Allah protect us, ever came face to face from a tank, my bet is we'd run. That's the human instinct. But this little boy, he was leaning into the tank. He was going to throw his stone without fear, no matter what happened to him. And I knew, sitting there with my new baby, I knew the men in that tank were afraid of him, and he was not afraid of that tank. The newscaster told me the boy's name was Faris O'Day, and he came from a place called Rafa Refugee Camp that I'd never heard of. And I want you to remember that name because it comes up later in my story. And I didn't know it at the time, 
But nine days after that photo, Faris O'Day was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. You see, he was Palestinian. The bullet went into his throat and he bled to death on the floor of his refugee camp, protecting the women of his village with a stone. Now that photo and the Qadr of Allah is the only explanation I have for everything that has happened since, even leading up to right being here today. Because I have been aware that I have not been guiding my ship for a very long time. And we all have moments where we think we're in charge, right? And it's good to have a plan. We're encouraged to have aspirations. But what if you let go of the steering wheel of your life? Who's actually guiding you? In 2005, I had a very good job as a journalist with a newspaper called The Mail on Sunday. I had a photo above a whole page, which is a bit like being a Hollywood star in media terms. I lived in a house in France with a big garden and a swimming pool and a husband and two children and everything that you could want in dunya. So why did I do this? Tell me. Why did I walk into my boss's office and say the words, I want to go to Palestine? I don't know. All I know is that I felt as if an, innocent, uh, an invisible hand was propelling me into that office and I had to go. I had to go in the way that sometimes if you're pregnant, you have to eat beans with cheese. I had to go. And my editor, he could have said, don't be ridiculous. You write about London life. You write about living in France. You don't write about the Middle East. Go away. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you can go to the left a bit, you can go to the right a bit, but you're going to reach the same destination that's been written for you. And the only question is, how much difficulty you put yourself through to get there. In January 2005, I found myself standing outside Tel Aviv airport with two weeks paid for by my boss to go and report on the um, elections in the West Bank. Now I knew so little about Palestine that I was standing there thinking, okay, how do I get from Israel to Palestine? I didn't know it was one place, subhanAllah. Man-made lines, by the way, don't count. This is Allah's world. As I was standing there wondering what to do next, a man came over to me and he said, Hi, my name is Jamal, but you can call me Jimmy. I said, Hi, Jimmy. He said, I am a taxi driver. Oh, brothers and sisters, did I tell you I was an actress? I used to be an actress, my dad's an actor. I find it very difficult not to do accents, but I promise you they're done with love. I have asked my Arab friends, do you mind if, when I do act? They said, no, it's good, no problem. <laughs> so, inshallah, I will keep doing it. If anybody objects, I'll stop, inshallah. So he said uh, he was a taxi driver from Jerusalem, and I got into his car, and he was to drive me to Ramallah. Over the next 65 minutes, Jimmy Jamal gave me 65 years of Palestinian history. It's quite a journey. But what I remember about that drive is that when we got into the rolling hills of the Holy Land, the beautiful place that pulls so many billions of people to it from around the world, the place where every rock cries Allah, where every olive and every tree shouts the names of the prophets. I remember being in the car and we were approaching a checkpoint and it was very busy, but on the mountain, on the hillside, was an empty road going in the same direction. So I said to my driver, 
uh, I know it's my first day here, but can we use that road on the hill because we'll get there quicker? He looked at me like I was crazy. Are you sure you're a journalist because you don't know much about Palestine? I said, I am a journalist. He said, look, that road up there is for Jews only. If I, an Arab Palestinian, take you there, we'll be shot dead in maybe five minutes. Still, you want to try? I said, no. I didn't want to try. One word came into my mind, and it was apartheid. And I don't want to get you guys into trouble, but we do have a right to talk about these things, you know. We have a right of citizens of whatever country we're in to have these debates. And I'm just repeating what I saw. When I arrived at my hotel room in Ramallah that first ever night in the Holy Land, I cried myself to sleep. Why? Because I'd seen one checkpoint and one apartheid road. And every single day of my waking life since, I wished that was the only problem that the people of Palestine have. There is a symptom that people who go to Gaza have, an illness, I should say. We call it Gazaitis. And it's actually not something that poisons you, it's a blessing, but it makes you ill. You see, anybody who goes to Gaza from the outside with an open heart, we want to go back. We want to go back as often as we can. Now, I didn't know this in 2006 when I made an excuse to go back to Palestine. I just knew I wanted to meet the people again. And this time, I had an experience of going through Erez. Erez is like a visit to hell. The people of Gaza, they don't frighten easily. But if you say Erez, everybody shudders. Erez is the checkpoint from hell, a place of ritual humiliation, a place where voices you can't see shout at you to take bits of your clothing off, pick things up, take things off, open this, shut that, for miles and miles. I was there waiting to leave. I'd done some writing and I was about to leave and it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I knew that as a foreigner, I had a chance to get through in three hours. And I realized that I'd need a taxi at one o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I spoke to you earlier about dower. Listen to this. I looked in my bag and I thought, how am I going to get a taxi from Erez in Israel to Jerusalem? I'm going to be stuck. I looked in my bag because I keep cards when I travel. And the card said, Jamal, taxi driver, Al-Quds. I thought, brilliant, I'll call him. There's no way that he'll come all the way from Jerusalem to Gaza to the Erez crossing, but still he might know another taxi driver and he won't remember me, but he seemed like a nice guy. This is the conversation. Hello, is that Jimmy Jamal? Is that Lauren Booth? The sun of Allah has arisen again over our blessed land. My wife will stop crying. My children will eat again. Allahu Akbar, welcome back to your home. We have missed you. Subhanallah, one taxi drive? The love, the love these people give. The love of the language of Arabic that we've been given. The love of the language of Urdu. Urdu. <laughs> Wrong accent. These are beautiful when you translate the words directly into our rather clunky Anglo-Saxon. It touches our heart and they're a gift you've been given, you know. And you forget about it and try to make everything sound, you know, as Western as possible. And it's very harsh. I said to Jimmy Jamal, um, I'm going to be at the checkpoint at one o'clock. Will you be able to meet me? He said, no problem. But that's not what happened, brothers and sisters. 
At 10 o'clock in the morning at the Erez checkpoint, I was with World Health Organization workers, members of the UN, members of the general public in Palestine, some uh, ministers from the Fatah government, the minister for um, airlines. I wonder if that was a made up job thinking about it. The Israelis kept us waiting. And there was an old lady in a wheelchair, and she was proudly telling everybody her story. I'm going to America, she said. My son lives in America. My son is paying for me to have expensive operation in America, and I'm going to walk again because I'm going to America. Did I tell you my son is in America? Over and over we heard this, and everybody was really excited for her. And around 11 o'clock, she was called through the horrible checkpoint, and she was wheeled off, and we waved her off. She went to her adventure to America. At midday, she was wheeled back. She said, I don't think they're going to let me go. They said uh, they don't have coordination. This is a big game. Coordination is imaginary. It's somebody flicking a switch or ticking a box. She had coordination. She had permission. We all rallied round and said to the Palestinian coordinator, make them take her or we're going to cause some problems. At one o'clock, Majdi was taken back through the checkpoint. We waved her off again and we waited. The longer we waited, the more sure we were that she'd gone. At four o'clock, she was wheeled back screaming. She'd missed her flight. She wasn't going to America. She was crying and screaming in Arabic, why are they doing this to me? I'm an old lady, I'm not a terrorist. Around five o'clock, everybody was allowed through the checkpoint from hell, myself included. My phone was dead, of course, and I'd booked the taxi at one o'clock in the afternoon, and I found myself standing in kind of a big industrial zone in the middle of Israel, in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, what am I going to do now? And then a car came quickly towards me, reversing with a screech of tires. And I thought, OK, what now? A door flew open. And Jimmy Jamal said, Salam alaikum. You want a taxi? I was confused. I said, yes, I ordered a taxi, but for one o'clock, five hours ago. He said, yes, I waited. I said, I I'm sorry. <laughs> You waited five hours? He said, of course. I said, why? He said, because I'm Muslim. And a Muslim would never leave a woman on her own and at risk. I got into his car and I started to cry. And it was one of those big cries that you do that you don't want men to see, the ones that go, <laughs> and they're not at all like the soap operas with just a tear. They're sort of snot and <laughs> Now, being an Arab, of course, he was very, very sympathetic. He said, stop crying, you're hysterical. I'll have to take you to hospital. But I couldn't stop crying. You're so nice and they're so horrible and it's so wrong. <laughs> in the end, he wouldn't let me stay in the hotel that I had booked. I went and stayed with his wife in their house. I've been their guest ever since on my journeys. May Allah bless them. Now, the reason I tell you that story is because it leads in to something very significant. The next day, I had 40 minutes a window to do my souvenir shopping. Can I just ask, are you waiting there to pass me something? How long? Alhamdulillah, I can do it, inshallah. 16, no, 14, inshallah. The next day, I had 40 minutes to do all of my souvenir shopping, and I was going into the old city of Jerusalem. I was dropped off in Jamal's taxi and told, be back on time, you have to be back early because you're going to get interrogated at the airport. I was in a bad mood, not looking forward to interrogation. It was raining. I was looking at my list, rather grumpy. I wasn't even noticing that I was on the same streets that Umar ibn Khattab will have walked and Isa alayhi salam will have walked. I didn't care about that. I had shopping to do. A young man came up to me and he said, 
Marhabar! So full of joy and energy you've never seen anything like the youth, the Palestinian youth, the Shabab, telling you, I wasn't in the mood. Yeah, okay. A voice in my head said, don't you dare, do not dare to be rude to a Palestinian in their own land when they have been so loving to you. Turn around and be nice to this young man. <sighs> Sir Mahabar, I said. He said, what can I do for you? I said, look, I've got some shopping to do. He said, this is amazing. All of the men in the souk are my uncles. We'll go shopping together. I gave in, and I gave him my list. Now, the list was mostly things that Europeans look for when we go to the Middle East. So, for example, I wanted two stuffed toy camels for my daughters. I didn't know that Palestine wasn't a desert even then. It's a beautiful place. Of course, it's green, but you want there to be camels, right? There are some camels. Yeah, there are camels. And uh, my husband at the time had wanted a ceremonial Arabic knife. Somebody had asked for a mother of pearl portrait of Yasser Arafat. They were quite complicated things. And at the bottom of my list, with a big question mark, was a Quran in English. Why the question mark? Because I didn't think there was such a thing as a Quran in English. I still thought that it was just a small group of people in Palestine and some Pakistani people in Britain, and they were about it. So why would anybody put this small desert faith into English language? Subhanallah. But I did want to read it. And I wanted to read it because in every home that I had gone into, especially in Palestine, but not only in Palestine. The people had been so good and so kind to the visitor that I thought that this book, the Quran, must be a handbook for being a good person. And it is. And I knew that I needed to be a better person and I wanted to read it for myself. We went into all of the shops along the old Arab quarter of Al-Quds, and in every shop, we had a cup of mint tea with 10 sugars in. 10 shops, 10 sugars, 100 sugars in one hour. No wonder people have diabetes, wallahi. But I got everything and much, much more. They just keep loading the bags up. And before I tell you what happened next, I want you to know something, that the Arab vendors in Al-Quds are very poor now. They really struggle, because when you go to Tel Aviv airport, and we're talking a lot about boycott these days. When you go to Tel Aviv airport as a foreign visitor, you will be told, don't buy anything off the Arabs, it's probably a bomb. Even if it looks like a cuddly toy, they might be hiding poison in it. So nobody buys off the Arabs anymore. Very few people. And it's hard to make a living. And I had bags and bags and bags of things that I grabbed and they put in bags. And I turned to this young man whose name I don't know because I only saw him that one day and I've never seen him again. I said to him, how much do I owe you? And he said, you don't owe me anything. Just one thing, when you go, please don't forget all of us in Palestine. Subhanallah, that's how I got my first ever copy of the Quran. As a gift from the people of Palestine to someone who came in peace. Subhanallah. In 2008, I got an email that would change my life again. And brothers and sisters, when Allah has a plan for you, you can go to the left or the right, but you will go in the direction written for you. And all of us have a direction. And all of us get reminders every day from Allah to come back to him. Is it a good deed that we ignore? Is it some litter we walk past? Is it something friendly we could do? Allah is calling us to good deeds and we ignore them. This one said, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? Call this number. 
I shouldn't have called the number. I had two children and a husband, and really it was a mission that could end in death. Going to Gaza by boat? Nobody can do that. There's a siege. There's the Israeli Navy there. I called the number. And the voice on the other end of the phone said, hello, this is Osama. I thought, no way. (laughs) Because honestly, Western people think there's only one Osama in the world. (laughs) I didn't occur to me there was somebody else called Osama. Anyway, it was a different Osama. So anybody from the uh, authorities here, different Osama. I went to my editor and I said, I want to go to Gaza by boat. He said, here's a check, go for two weeks. I thought, is he just trying to get rid of me? And in August, actually in July 2008, I flew to Cyprus and I joined 45 other non-Muslims from around the world to get onto two boats full of food and hearing aids for children to try and break the siege of Gaza. All we wanted to do was get the world to look at the suffering there, what it was like under siege. That was our only thing to do, just to get people to look. It took 36 hours and the boat went like this the whole way. Everybody was sick, alhamdulillah, except for me. I don't know why that was. I think I was too busy making cups of tea. Even our captain was sick. He was lying on the ground saying, I wish I was dead, which is not a good sign when you're about to go and meet the Israeli Navy. They never turned up. I think they thought we were going to sink by ourselves. And on August the 23rd, 2008, there in the distance was Gaza, beautiful Gaza. We'd made it. And as we got closer, I started to see dots on the beach And I couldn't make out what they are. And you can look this up. Put into Google, Free Gaza, photos, and you'll see us going like this. And when we got closer, we realized the dots were people. 30,000 Palestinians from Gaza had come to cheer the crazy foreigners in who'd risked their lives in solidarity. And when we got closer and closer, a sound hit us, which I will never forget because it was so sweet. And the sound was, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And it came over us and washed over us. I was supposed to leave five days later, but I didn't want to be a grief tourist. It didn't feel right. And my feet felt as if they were glued to the sand of Gaza. And I waved off the free Gaza, my only way back to my children. And Greta Berlin said to me, why aren't you getting on the boat? I said, I can't. And do you know what month of the year it was, brothers and sisters? What month of the year it was? Ramadan. I'm really gonna struggle with this now. Bismillah. Uh, Sorry, it's just uh, difficult with what's going on at the moment. So I was there for the whole of Ramadan as a non-believer in 2008. I had my arms showing, my hair was out, my sense of modesty wasn't exactly what we might appreciate. But did I hear haram, haram from the people in Gaza? Not once. As I walked the streets in Ramadan with my arms and my hair showing, all I heard was salam, salam, salam. One night, I was visiting a very poor family. In a place called Rafa which pretty much doesn't exist anymore. And Rafa is also the place where Faris Ode came from, remember? 
Eight years after seeing that photo of that young boy, I was in the story, I was in the TV set, and none of it had been my planning. And this night, I knocked on a very poor door in a pathetic, run-down refugee camp, and the lady opened it like this, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, fadalu. Welcome. She welcomed me as if she lived in the Taj Mahal, not in a slum. And her face was so bright. And I wonder if she's alive and okay now. Her face was so bright. And I know now the word for it is Noor. Her face was full of Noor. And I went into her home. And what was her home, brothers and sisters? One single cement room. Cement floor, cement walls, and nothing in it at all. Nothing but some old mattresses that she, her husband, his parents, and their children all slept on at night. And I felt angry at this Islam. I couldn't understand why would people fast? Why would any deity make people go hungry who were already hungry? And I said to this mother of Rafa refugee camp, Why do you fast in Ramadan? What is the point? You say your God makes you do without food for 30 days, but on day 31 you have no food. You say your God makes you thirsty for 30 days, but on day 31 you only have dirty water or no water. What's the point? Why do you fast? And this mother looked at me and she said, Well, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. She had nothing, and I couldn't understand it. How can she be fasting for other people? How could she remember other people's poverty when she had nothing? And at that moment, a thought came into my mind, if this is Islam, I want to be Muslim. If this love of God is in a religion, I want to be in that religion. If this love for your fellow human being, even at your moment of hardship, if this is a religion, I want to be in that religion. And if this love for the visitor and for the traveler is a religion, then let me be a Muslim, subhanAllah. But it took two years for me to take my shahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how long it takes for us to be humbled and for our hearts to be cleansed of some of the things that we have in them. And I just want to say now that the most said word in Gaza right now is Alhamdulillah. Do you know that? Wallahi. The people run into the streets and some of the mothers hand out sweets and say Alhamdulillah, not because they love death for their children. No, we are not a death cult. We are a religion of life. We are a religion that loves children, but we accept shaheed and we accept the qadr of Allah. And these people understand what is being asked of them. May Allah grant them all the highest of Jannah. They hand out sweets. Let me give you a final example, brothers and sisters. There was a family I know in Bayat Hanun. Bayat Hanun no longer exists. Do you know six Hiroshimas have happened to Gaza in the past 40 days, 30 days? Six Hiroshimas. Bayat Hanun is gone. But this day I was in Bayat Hanun and I went to visit a poor family. And the mother's name was Iman. And she showed me her 11 children. And she introduced them by their name and their injury. Omar was six. But he looked four. They're very stunted with hunger. And he had scarring up his legs, and the scarring was from white phosphorus, which is napalm of the 21st century. 
It gives you cancer, they think. She introduced me to her 16-year-old son, Marshala, a tall, attractive young man going with dreams of going to university. He had a big plaster on his leg. She pulled it off casually. He had a bullet in his shin, shot by an Israeli sniper outside his home. But there were two little girls that really touched me in the empty room, sitting, rocking like this, and I said, what's wrong with them? She said, we don't know, but they haven't talked since 2008, and we think it's shell shock. Subhanallah. I went into a back room to pray Maghrib, and I started to cry. When I was in sujood, the tears left my eyes so hard, I thought I was going to go blind. And I thought of Yaqub, alayhi salam, and how he grieved for his son, Yusuf. And I thought, yes, you can go blind from grief. And this mother put her hand on my shoulder and said, Miss, why are you crying? I said, I'm crying for you. I'm crying because your children are going to keep getting killed and nobody's doing anything. And I'm crying because the world knows and they're not going to help you. And I'm crying because I'm here and I can't help you. And she looked at me strangely and she said, you're crying for us? I said, yes. She said, but we're so happy. She said, we have Allah and Allah loves us. And he's told us that if we are steadfast and patient, it's Jannah, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah for any, everything and everything, brothers and sisters, that we have is for Allah and in service of him. And may he forgive us and may he forgive me for all mistakes in this talk. And may he bless all those who are under oppression. And may he forgive us. All praises for him. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>